Hello fellows, Mr. Creepy Creeps here. If you are new here, you can subscribe our channel. We upload daily horror videos. It was the craziest fucking thing. The old guy didn't fall down right after Stacy shot him. He just stood there for probably at least 10 seconds, wobbling unsteadily on his feet, a dazed look on his face. Apart from the blood trickling down between his eyes and the hole in the center of his forehead, he looked like some poor damn idiot with Alzheimer's in a nursing home who got up in the middle of the night to take a piss, but then forgot what he was doing and was just standing there in the hallway, confused, waiting for a nurse to come along and guide him back to his room. The four of us, me, Stacy, Val, and Hutch, just stood there speechlessly, watching in disbelief. Finally, the old guy realized he was dead and dropped like a sack of potatoes. By then, his brains had already finished running down the wall behind him. For a long time, none of us reacted. It was Val who spoke first. That was some freaky shit, he remarked and laughed, kind of nervously. Never saw nothing like that. Stacy agreed with a nod, pocketing his 9mm. Gotta give it to the old fuck. He died hard. He bent down and retrieved the spent casing, putting it in his pocket with the gun. Our business with the old guy finished, we turned our attention to the door he had been guarding. It was a weird door, given the location. It looked like the kind of door you'd see in a bank heist movie. Heavy, reinforced steel with thick hinges and a huge wheel lock with a high-tech digital combination beside it. It looked like the door of a vault which was exactly what it was. A weird fucking place for a vault, in the basement of a crumbling old long-abandoned building way out in the middle of the desert. This whole job was pretty weird, if you thought about it. Why the fuck had the Russian tasked us with driving all the way across the fucking country to off some old fucking bust, open a vault to retrieve an item, and then not even tell us what it was? We had asked, of course, but he had just brushed us off and told us it was a personal favor to an associate of his. It didn't matter, really. It wasn't our business to question the Russian's business, and his associate was paying us a shitload for this particular assignment. Hutch was crouched over his backpack, already unloading his equipment. How long do you figure? Stacy asked him, lighting a Marlboro. 45 an hour tops, Hutch replied, screwing a bit in his portable drill. Stacy seemed satisfied with that answer, and if Stacy was satisfied, I was satisfied. Hutch was the best safe cracker, or a PD as Stacy called him for some reason, I ever met. He had learned the trade from his celly at Bayside, an old pro he considered to be the best. If Hutch said he could crack the vault in an hour, he probably could. Stacy told Val to go upstairs and keep watch in case anyone showed up outside. Val did as he was told. Stacy stood, arms folded, smoking his cig, and calmly watched as Hutch put on his safety goggles and began to drill into the steel door right next to the combination. Meanwhile, with nothing else much to do, I began to poke around the basement just to pass the time. There wasn't much to poke around, really. An old table and chair, piles of rusty junk in the corners, a stack of old porn magazines from the 1970s. I picked up one and glanced through it, whistling, chicks with more hair than a barbershop floor. I pocketed a couple for later viewing. Besides that, there wasn't much else. My eyes fell upon a book sitting on an otherwise bare shelf. I picked it up. It was bound in black leather. The cover was blank. I opened it and saw it was some kind of journal or logbook or something. I skimmed the first page idly, then not so idly. I turned a page and read a little more. Turned another page and read a little more. Yo, Stace, check this shit out, I told him, showing him the book. What the fuck's that? Stacy asked without much interest. I think it was the old guy's. There's some pretty weird shit in here, I told him, then looked at the page and began to read aloud. 
June 17th, it started moving again. After three months, the goddamn thing started moving again. Just when I was beginning to think it was finally truly dead. I turned a couple pages. August 3rd, it began singing today. First it sang in German, then in French, then in Russian, then in several languages I didn't recognize. I don't know what it's singing, but it won't stop. It's driving me crazy. I turned several more pages. September 28th. It keeps talking to me in the voice of my dead mother. Even through eight inches of steel, I can hear it. I think it's speaking to me telepathically. It tells me, in my mother's voice, that it's my fault Ellie died when I was 12. It curses me and says I'm going to burn in hell for causing her death. I don't know how much longer I can stand it. I looked at Stacy, creep it out. What do you make of that? Stacy looked unimpressed. He shrugged. Obviously the guy was batshit. We did him a favor. Hutch finished with his drill and set it aside. He took out a small electric gadget with wires hooked up to it and carefully inserted the wires into the hole he'd drilled. He flipped a switch on his little doohickey and an LED screen on it lit up with a bunch of flashing red numbers. He looked over his shoulder at Stacy. Here goes nothing, he said, then turned a dial on his safe-cracking gizmo. Me and Stacy watched intently as the flashing red numbers began speeding rapidly backwards. As soon as they all hit zero, they froze and turned from red to a bright green. There was an electronic crackling sound and a small puff of smoke rose from the vault's combination keypad. Then there was a hollow, metallic clunk. The sound of the vault's locks releasing. Hutch cackled triumphantly. Open sesame! He stepped aside and Stacy went to the vault door and spun the wheel. He pulled open the steel door and the three of us looked in. The interior of the vault was a narrow cinder block room, not much bigger than a good-sized closet. There was only one object inside, a large leather duffel bag neatly laid out on the concrete floor. That's it, Stacy said, nodding with satisfaction. That's exactly how the Russian described it. We stepped in and gathered around the duffel bag. It was about four feet long, two feet wide, and maybe a foot tall. There was no zipper. It was one of those old school ones that opened at the top, the kind you used a drawstring to clench shut. Only instead of a drawstring, this one had a thick chain looped through brass rings sewn into the leather. The ends of the chain were secured with a big padlock. You two, Stacy said, pointing at me and Hutch. Lift it up, let's haul it up top and get the fuck out of here. Me and Hutch knelt down and grabbed a hold of the duffel bag, and immediately both of us recoiled in shock. Hey! Hutch shouted. What the fuck? What is it? Stacy demanded. There's something alive in there, I stammered. Something in there moved. We both felt it. What the fuck is this thing anyway? Hutch asked, sounding uneasy. Are you both strung out on something? Stacy asked, giving us a look of contempt. That fucking bag's been in here for years. There's no fucking way anything in it could still be alive. I'm telling you something in it moved, I insisted. Maybe a rat got in it somehow, Hutch suggested. Let's open it and see. No, Stacy instantly overrode him. No one's opening that goddamn thing. The Russian gave us specific instructions. And when the Russian tells you something, you fucking will better do it. Stacy, just tell us, what the fuck's inside it? I pressed him. How the fuck should I know? The Russian didn't tell me much more than he told you. And even if I knew, it ain't any of your fucking business anyway. It's the Russian's and the Russian's associate's business. Now pick up that fucking bag and let's move. He ordered us with a cold stare. Me and Hutch exchanged a nervous look, then reluctantly we picked up the duffel bag. I waited for whatever was in it to move again, but it didn't. The bag was surprisingly light for its bulky size. 
maybe 40 pounds at the most, about the weight of a bag of rock salt. We carried it out of the vault, across the basement, and up the stairs, Stacy following behind and supervising us. We arrived at the first floor and carried the bag through the decrepit old warehouse or factory or whatever the fuck this place had been. And outside, where Val was standing beside Stacy's car, smoking a cigarette. By now it was early evening and the sun was starting to set. We got it, Stacy told Val. Let's load it and get to Vegas. Hey, Hutch said abruptly, looking around. You hear something? What? I asked. I thought I heard something just now, he said. It sounded like... Like what? Stacy said. It sounded like a little girl laughing. Hutch finished. He looked uneasily around. None of you heard it? I didn't hear shit, Val replied with a dismissive shrug. Me neither, I told Hutch. Stacy surveyed the barren desert landscape. There's no one else out here. You must have imagined it. Yeah, must have, Hutch said and forced out a shaky laugh. Guess this whole deal's made me kind of jumpy. Just put it in the trunk and let's get rolling, Stacy said. He opened his trunk and we deposited the duffel bag inside. As he slammed the trunk lid, I breathed a sigh of relief to not be holding that fucking thing anymore. It gave me the creeps. What about the old guy's body? Val asked, pointing to the building. Just leave it for the coyotes, Stacy answered. This place is in the middle of nowhere. No one will find him for months, maybe years. By then, there won't be much left of him. The four of us got in Stacy's car. He started it up and pulled down the rutted, eroded dirt road, away from the old dump and back onto the highway. He turned west, heading toward Vegas, a two-hour drive away. The sun finished setting and night fell on us like a black sheet. None of us said much. We just sat there while Stacy drove, watching the highway unfold in the beam of his headlights. About half an hour passed without incident. Then Hutch started losing his mind. I was sitting next to him in the back seat, so I noticed it first. He just seemed kind of jittery and paranoid at first, twitching and constantly looking around bug-eyed. I figured he was still spooked from what had happened earlier. Then he leaned close and whispered to me, Do you hear it? Huh? Do you hear that voice? What voice? I asked him. It's my older brother Anthony. He died of an overdose when I was 15. I can hear him whispering to me. He says he's still awake in his coffin. He can feel the maggots eating him. He can feel himself rotting. He says it hurts. Even though he's dead, it still hurts. He looked me in the eyes and I realized he was terrified. Unsettled, I moved away from him as much as I could. No, man, I don't hear nothing, I told him, trying to sound calm. He didn't say anything, just leaned back and kept looking around with wide, fearful eyes. About ten minutes later, he finally snapped and started screaming, Jesus Christ, shut up, make him shut up, make him shut up, make him shoot up. I shouted and jumped in shock. Stacy and Val in the front seat also shouted. Stacy was so startled by Hutch's outburst, he jerked the wheel and the car swerved wildly, almost going off the road, tires shrieking. Stacy slammed on the brakes and jerked his head around to face us. What the fuck? He yelled. Make him shut up! Hutch just kept on screaming, rocking back and forth wildly, hands clamped over his ears. What the fuck is your problem? Stacy shouted at him, pissed but also scared. Hutch frantically undid his seatbelt, threw open his door, and scrambled from the car in a panic. Hey, where the fuck's he going, Stacy said, removing his own seatbelt and going out after him. Me and Val did the same. Hutch was standing behind Stacy's car, pounding wildly on the trunk, still screaming. He had totally lost it. We have to burn it! It's the devil! We have to burn it! It's the devil! We have... 
Stacy delivered a hard backhand to Hutch's face and he was knocked sprawling to the road. Then he grabbed Hutch with both hands by the front of his shirt and hauled him to his feet. Their faces were only inches apart. <laughs> Are you out of your fucking mind? What the fuck did you take? You could have got us all killed pulling that shit. Hutch stared at Stacy, dazed, his nose bleeding. The blow seemed to have knocked some sense back into him, and he seemed calmer, but still frightened. Don't you hear it? He glanced at me and Val. Don't any of you hear it? Hear what? Stacy demanded. That fucking thing in the trunk, it's talking. First it was just whispering, but now it's getting louder and louder. It's fucking screaming now. What the fuck are you talking about? Stacy said, still holding him by his shirt. It's alive, and it knows things. It can read our thoughts. It knows everything about us. Our whole lives. All our dark secrets. Jesus Christ, you are insane, Stacy said in a flat voice. Open the trunk. Just open the trunk, Stacy, Hutch said pleadingly. You'll see I'm right. Just open the trunk. Stacy favored him with a look of contempt. Fine. He let go of Hutch, then strode back up front and pulled the trunk release. The trunk lid popped open. Stacy came back and lifted it. The duffel bag was lying exactly as we had left it, silent and unmoving. All four of us looked at it for some time. Stacy turned back to Hutch with a disgusted smirk. There, you satisfied? It ain't moving and it ain't making a fucking sound. It's all in your fucking head. Hutch looked at Stacy. There were tears in his eyes. You still can't hear it, can you? He nearly whispered. Even this close, you still can't. None of us can hear shit because there ain't shit to hear. That thing is pure fucking evil, whatever it is, Hutch said. We have to get rid of it. We have to destroy it. Now wait a goddamn, Stacy began. Hutch reached suddenly into his jacket. He pulled out his gun. Hey, Stacy shouted, pulling his own pistol on Hutch. Put that fucking thing down, now. Hutch didn't put it down. Instead, he aimed his gun at the duffel bag in the trunk. Fuck, Stacy yelled and pulled the trigger on his 9mm. Blam. A yellow flare erupted from the muzzle. The gunshot echoed off the highway and rolled across the desert. Hutch dropped to his knees, shot between his left eye and ear. Seemingly in slow motion, he slumped to the ground. All three of us stood there looking down at the body, stunned. Oh, Jesus, Val moaned. He left me no choice, Stacy said, putting away his gun. Dude was a psycho. What are we going to do? I asked him, beginning to panic. We'll bury him in the desert, then we go on to Vegas and drop off the package as planned. Stacy said, surprisingly calm. We don't have any shovels, Val pointed out. No shit, Sherlock, we'll have to use our hands. He looked down the deserted highway in both directions. We gotta move fast too before someone else comes along. What if someone shows up while we're burying him? Val asked. Stacy thought for a moment. He reached in the trunk, under the duffel bag, and took out a jack handle. You two bury him, I'll stay here with the car. Anyone shows up, I'll say I'm changing the tire. Now hurry up. Me and Val lifted Hutch's corpse and carried it off the road and into the desert about a hundred yards. Using our bare hands, we dug a shallow grave in the dry soil. We dumped Hutch in, then hastily covered him up. We did a pretty piss-poor job without shovels, and I knew it wouldn't take long for the animals to uncover him, but hopefully by then we would be back on the East Coast and far away from here. Finished, our hands dirty and bloody. We returned to the car. Okay, I said to Stacy, it's done, let's... I stopped abruptly. Stacy was standing over the still open trunk, rigid as a statue, looking down intensely at the duffel bag. His jaw was clenched, and his eyes were locked on the duffel bag. Stace, what's up? I asked. Slowly, he looked at me and Val. He was trembling slightly, 
I realized he was afraid. He seemed to have trouble finding his voice. He swallowed hard, then said, Hutch was right. It is alive. What do you mean? I asked, feeling a prickly sensation on my skin. It's singing. Can't you hear it? It started singing right after you left. I don't... I began, but Val cut me off. I hear it too. It is singing. I glanced at Val. He was gazing into the trunk and had the same distant, fearful expression as Stacy. I listened intently but couldn't hear anything. Are you both nuts? I can't hear Kamu, but then I did hear it. It started abruptly as if a switch had been flipped. I didn't seem to be hearing it with my ears. It was as if a voice was speaking in my mind. The high, cheerful voice of a very young girl, singing in a language I couldn't identify. It was a pleasant sound, but somehow, I could sense there was something malevolent in the words she was singing. A curse of death or damnation, or both. It was like a demon was singing in the voice of an angel. I felt like I was about to piss my pants. I hadn't been that terrified since I had been a little kid, afraid of the boogeyman hiding under my bed or in my closet. Jesus Christ, I said hoarsely, what the fuck is it? Let's just get rid of it, Val said in a tight, frightened voice. Let's dump it in the desert and leave it. We can't, Stacy said reluctantly, although I could tell he wanted to. The Russian will kill us if we do. We have to finish the job. We have to get this thing to Vegas. He looked at me and Val. Get back in the car. If we're lucky, we can get this over with in another hour. And so we did. Stacy pulled back onto the road and we went on our way, driving in a fearful silence. We could still hear it singing. Even over the sound of the engine, we could hear it in our minds, singing endlessly. In desperation, Stacy even turned on the radio and set the volume as high as it would go. But even through the deafening blare coming from the speakers, we could still hear that fucking thing singing. I could tell it was getting on all of our nerves. Val kept rocking back and forth in his seat, muttering to himself, and Stacy was clutching the steering wheel so tightly, his knuckles turned white. I knew it was only a matter of time until it drove us insane just like it had poor Hutch. At some point, we crossed the state line from Arizona into southern Nevada, and finally, after what felt like an eternity, I saw a green sign that said, Las Vegas, 10 miles. Thank God, I heard Stacy sigh. We didn't drive into the city. Our destination was a long, deserted industrial complex on the outskirts, that was where we were supposed to drop off the item for the Russian's associate to pick up. It was a spooky place to visit in the middle of the night. Abandoned buildings, smokestacks, and heaps of rusted machinery everywhere. Stacy drove down a narrow, bumpy road overgrown with weeds that had sprouted through the cracked asphalt. He stopped in front of a chain-link gate. He got out to unlock it. The Russian had given him the key but he stopped when he saw the gate was already unlocked. The gate was standing ajar, swinging slightly in the wind. He pulled it open the rest of the way, then looked down at something on the ground and froze. He looked for a moment, then knelt and picked something up. Through the windshield, I could see what the object was. It was the chain and padlock that had secured the gate. The padlock was still fastened to the chain but the chain itself was horribly twisted and bent, and several of the links had been broken. It looked like someone had blown it off the gate with a stick of dynamite. No, that's not right. It looked like it had been pulled apart by a very strong pair of hands, like a little kid's chain made out of Play-Doh. Stacy dropped it, looked around nervously, then got back in the car and drove through the gate. At some point, I realized the singing voice in my head had fallen silent. It had stopped some time ago. Stacy drove for a few minutes through the maze of decaying plants and factories, then slowed to a stop. About 20 yards ahead of us was a black limousine with its engine on, idling. That's him, Stacy said, putting the car in park. This is it. 
He looked at me and Val. Go get it out of the trunk. Bring it to the limo and place it on the ground, then get back in. That's all you have to do. Me and Val got out and went around to the rear as Stacy popped the trunk. I lifted the lid. We started to reach for the duffel bag, then jumped back in horrified shock. God! Val gasped. The bag was moving, rippling and convulsing and spasming. A couple times it actually leaped up a couple inches off the floor of the trunk. It was like the bag was full of hundreds of small squirming animals, or maybe insects, that were writhing around inside trying to burst out. It was asleep when we opened the vault. I remember thinking only half coherently. It started to wake up after we took it out. Now it's fully awake. I looked at Val and he looked at me. His face was a mask of sick terror. There were actually tears in his eyes. I don't think I can do it, he told me in a choked voice. We have to. Come on, let's get this over with. Bracing ourselves, we grabbed the bag at both ends, trying to hold it as far away from us as possible, and carried it to the limo. Only 20 yards, but it felt like a mile. I could feel those things moving through the leather. It was like carrying a bag full of snakes or some other kind of slimy, repulsive reptile. It was sickening. I felt my stomach heaving. When we were about five feet from the idling limo, we lowered the duffel bag to the ground. I felt the most immense sense of relief of my life the moment I removed my hands from it, and I could see Val felt exactly the same way. Both of us scrambled back to Stacy's car away from the fucking cursed bag. Done, I said, taking a deep, shaky breath. Let's go. We can't until we collect the payment, Stacy answered. I was about to tell Stacy to screw the payment. I just wanted to get as far away from that bag as possible, but he spoke first. Look, he pointed out the windshield. The driver's side door of the limousine was opening. A shadowy figure emerged. It was hard to tell from the distance in the dark, but the figure seemed to be wearing a robe and a hood of some kind, and it walked strangely, with a slumped, unnatural gait. With agonizing slowness, it shuffled to the rear of the limo and opened the door. A second figure exited from the passenger compartment. It was much taller than the driver, with a muscular build and broad shoulders. It was wearing a black suit. It wore its long hair, also black, in a ponytail. I never saw its face. It kept its back to the headlights of Stacy's car as it walked to the duffel bag and crouched beside it. But I did see its hand. It reached down and caressed the leather duffel bag lovingly before lifting it in its arms and carrying it, gently as a baby, into the limo. The unseen driver closed the rear door, got back in the driver's seat, and the limo drove off. The three of us watched until its taillights vanished into the night. There was now a briefcase sitting upright on the ground where we had placed the duffel bag. I don't know where it came from. The limo's passenger hadn't been carrying one when he, or it, it retrieved the bag. But it was there now like it just popped out of nowhere. Stacy got out himself to fetch the briefcase. All the color seemed to have drained from his face. He brought it inside the car and handed it to me in the back seat. Open it. I forced myself to unlatch the briefcase and lifted the top, fearful of what it might contain. Money. And a lot of it. Stacks and stacks of newly printed hundred dollar bills. I held the briefcase up for Stacy's inspection. He nodded. All the tension seemed to ease from him. Okay, he said. Stacy drove into Vegas and rented us a suite of rooms in a hotel on the Strip. He and Val are down in the casino gambling and looking for women. I'm up here by myself getting drunk. Tomorrow Stacy will call the Russian to tell him the job is done and then we'll head back east. It was easily the weirdest, scariest job I was ever part of. At least it was a good payday. 
especially now that the money only has to be split three ways instead of four. I guess I should be glad that it's over. Except I'm not entirely sure it is over. Whatever was in that duffel bag was obviously kept locked in that vault for a good reason. Now it's out in the world, in the hands of whoever that was in the limousine. I still don't have a fucking clue what was in that bag. And frankly, I don't want to know. In fact, I could live the rest of my life and die quite happily never knowing. I don't know who the Russian's associate was either, or what he wanted with the duffel bag in the first place. But whoever he is, I don't believe he has good intentions with it. I saw his hand when he touched the duffel bag. The skin was beet red, with unusually long fingers and thick black fingernails that ended in points, like claws.